one of the big questions is when did this great divergence start? Okay. We do see that the countries of uh, Northern and Western Europe are much richer uh, than those of Asia and Africa and therefore in some of that wealth or prosperity seems to transfer over to their colonies like the United States and uh, Canada and Australia and so on. So when did this great divergence start? That helps us to understand why it started. Okay? So for a long time there's been considerable debate about whether the industrial revolution is responsible for this great divergence or whether the divergence had begun before the industrial revolution in which case you could say uh, that some amount of a certain threshold level of prosperity is necessary to launch an industrial revolution. So it also would revise our views of how growth and development happens. So it's important to know what happened in history. Uh, the second thing, of course, as you saw, why do certain countries catch up and others do not? So here you can see, you know, is it a coincidence that Singapore is a British colony and Niger a French one? Who knows? We don't know. But that's the kind of things historians and economists want to know. And so in, in general, the other big question we use historical data to answer is what role do historical circumstances play in explaining the modern development outcomes? Okay? Uh, so what I'm going to go through is some of the papers I assigned you. Uh, and what I will do is ask you to interrupt any time and ask questions. Okay? I will pause and ask for questions at some points, but you should also meanwhile, if things are not clear, just raise your hand. So these are the three main uses of historical data in economics as it stands right now. One is this broad sweeps of history, chart the historical economic progress of countries or regions. That's the broad Barika Studios and Gupta paper which are assigned, which is trying to track India's growth over the long run. So I thought that would be particularly interesting for us to read. And in fact, that was one of my private benefits from taking up this summer school teaching assignment is actually I, I sat and read this paper. So I've been meaning to read this paper for a long time, so now I actually sat and read it. The second thing, of course, is examine the role of ex historical factors in economic development. These are the two papers I assigned you. One is a paper I wrote, a Banerjee and Nair 2005, and the other one is by Nathan Nunn on slavery. And here we are not only uh, asking how much does history contribute to explaining uh, modern day outcomes, but uh, you'll see both these papers use some accidents of history as exogenous drivers of long run growth determinants like institutions and institutional quality. And then the last paper I signed on the reading list was this very brand new paper, Mayor Alan Olson, which is testing a particular theory of growth and state formation in particular. What helps to build strong states? Uh, how can you think about state capacity? There, is a lot, there are a lot of states uh, in the modern times which are much less than, uh, which have, do not have enough state capacity. Governance quality is very weak in many, many countries of the world. How can that be strengthened? What are the factors which go into it? So again, this is a paper I became aware of just last week. So because I met one of the authors and they said, I have this paper. I said, I'm teaching the historical data session. All right. Let's get this in. It's, uh, I thought it was quite fascinating. They're using data from ancient Egypt uh, of all places. All right, so we're getting to, uh, let me track the first one. This is the charting the estimates of GDP for India from the pre, for the pre-1871 period, okay? And combining them with population estimates to come up with GDP per capita. So this is going to be, as we, we will walk through the methodology, it's a very hard exercise, but I think the authors are motivated by three very big questions which these data are needed to answer, okay? One is, how did, you know, what has been the history of our country? Did India experience an economic decline after the Mughal era? Different, many people have said that this was, uh, there was a very big decline. Okay, how big was the decline? So was there a decline? How big was it? Was it a steady secular decline? Was it only happening in certain periods? Was the decline reversed? If so, when? All of these things just to understand our own history. The second, of course, has been a big narrative about deindustrialization in India. Okay? Uh, that colonial rule, particularly British colonial rule, uh, introduced a lot of British-made industrial goods, particularly textiles, and thereby decimated uh, domestic industry. Again, there have been people on big, both sides of the debate. There have been people who say that this was uh, absolutely catastrophic and uh, uh, ruined India forever, etc. cetera. Uh, and there have been others who have been a little less, uh, less extreme. So again, we want to know how bad was this phenomenon. And 
economically, it's also important to understand was it an absolute or relative deindustrialization. What do we mean by that? Absolute deindustrialization means actually industrial output declined. There was actually a decline in production, while relative just means that industry grew slower than other parts of the economy, so the share of industry in GDP declined. Okay? Again, it's particularly interesting because India is still struggling uh, to increase industry. So if you look at the manufacturing share of GDP, it hasn't moved, I think, for 30 years at least. So it's been, you know, a lot of the decline in the agricultural share of GDP has been made up by the services sector uh, in the Indian economy. So industry hasn't taken off here. And of course, the big question, when did the great divergence between Europe and the rest of the world begin? Uh, this data will help to answer that. So how do they do these estimates? So you can imagine that there was no central statistical organization uh, way back in 1800 or wherever. And it is really hard to construct these estimates. What they're going to do is they're going to take the output approach. They're going to, so you know, if you think about modern day GDP estimates, we take the expenditure approach. We do consumption, investment, government services, exports, minus imports. They don't do that. They take the sectoral approach. They do agricultural output plus industrial output plus services output. Now, each of these terms is really hard to find data on. So it takes a lot of painstaking data collection uh, over time. So they want a time series because they want to track these big changes over time. And as you will notice, it also sometimes you have to make assumptions. They may be better, worse, sometimes quite heroic uh, assumptions in order to put these data together to make somewhat credible estimates. And to their credit, the authors have done as much cross-checking as they possibly could, given the circumstances. This is some of the best economic historians on this topic, so this is sort of the best possible thing you can do. You will notice as we go through the number of variables you need to construct these estimates, getting data on each of these variables is itself a significant contribution. In fact, as I will point out, each of these single variables which they use to make this GDP estimate is a paper in itself. Uh, which has been published. So just getting data, for instance, on a population time series from 1600 to 1900 is a paper, uh, and that it has been published. So they have taken uh, estimates. It's a very hard task to do. Okay? So let's walk through how they do this. The way they do this, they first look at agriculture. They say, well, agricultural output, we are going to estimate as the sum of agricultural consumption plus exports. Now, how do you estimate agricultural consumption, right? There's no <laughs> real consumption surveys. So what they say is first, well, we'll make some estimate of income per capita, or sort of daily wages type of estimate. And we are going to assume that agricultural consumption, which is obviously from, at this time, food consumption, is related to per capita income with an elasticity of 0.4. Now, where do they pull 0.4 from, right? Why, why 0.4? Why not 0.7? Why not, you know, who knows? Uh, what, again, they have been very careful in picking these estimates. They have looked at many, many different types of studies. So they've looked at studies for early modern Europe where much more, much better data is available uh, for European countries. And other economic historians have estimated uh, an elasticity of 0.5. They take 0.4, they look at other studies in developing countries in the modern era, sort of really poor countries, and they look at uh, estimates of food demand, uh, and those elasticities with respect to income come out to be something like 0.3 to 0.6. So they picked something in the middle. They, uh, to their credit, they have also tested how sensitive would the estimates be if they picked 0.3 or 0.5 instead of 0.4. Uh, but that's the best you can do in the sense you pick an estimate which is at least justified for, by some other uh, uh, assumptions. Okay? So then uh, you want to get an estimate of per capita income to apply this elasticity to. What they do is they obtain estimates of daily wages and grain prices. So this whole daily wages and grain prices is a whole other paper by the same authors, by Broadbury and Gupta. And I went and looked at that paper, which is even more painstaking, because for every period, they go through every possible historical source they can find. And for every period, they literally find, to find one number, I don't know how many things they read. But it's a different source for every single number. Okay? So just putting together this time series, it may look like, oh, there's only 10 observations. But you had to consult at least 10 different sources, see whether it makes sense. Con think about what units they're measuring in, right? So sometimes it will be given in, well, kilo wasn't even there, right? It'll be given in some mun and it'll be given in some other uh, 
uh, unit of uh, weight and uh, it will be given uh, and many times they will say you know the daily wage was so many rupees but the rupee was not constant over time or over different uh, areas so they had to convert everything to a constant unit so some kind of a, when you think about uh, they compute something like a silver wage they had to figure out how many how much silver was in each kind of rupee so it's really hard work and you have to know a lot of the historical context to do this kind of to create a, even a consistent series okay so as I said they rely on their own, own earlier paper uh, to get these estimates of daily wages and grain prices so then they can compute a grain wage which is how many kilos of uh, grain can an average laborer buy okay and they're using mostly uh, wage data for unskilled labor for a couple of periods only they have skilled versus unskilled separately and again here you can see in for Europe the data series are so much better if you look at European countries you have massive time series for both unskilled and skilled labor starting even earlier from 1300s and so on but this is what we got so then they get this series they get this um, and they, of course they do not have it in every year obviously they have it you know when certain historians did certain types of work and certain records. So um, it's interesting how much historians, economic historians of India are still relying on Akbar's Any Akbari, which Abul Fazl made. It was a big survey uh, of all the agriculture, especially agriculture, but also some of industry. But a huge agricultural survey commissioned by Emperor Akbar in 1595, uh, that is considered still an extremely good source uh, of data on wages, prices. Uh, productivity, acreage, right? People are still using that because that was the most well documented. After that, uh, anything of equal comprehensiveness was basically something like the eight, late 1800s or in the 1900s by the British. Between those periods, you do not have such comprehensive surveys of a huge area. So you have to rely on estimates from here and there, some accounts by some travelers or some accounts by some other king here some reports by the Dutch East India Company when they were trying to make an empire, uh, some reports by the East India Company saying, oh, this is what uh, weavers are paid here, or this is how much I paid for a shirt when I came here type of things. Uh, so it's, a, it's a very scattered data, okay? Anyway, they get that. Then they multiply by the population estimates to get total agricultural consumption, right? This is per capita, and then they multiply. Now getting the population estimate, whole other paper uh, which they take it from. So they get that. Uh, that's one, one part of one series. Uh, then they wanted to uh, also estimate exports because, mm -hmm. yes? Correct. India was, uh, by all accounts, was not importing agricultural goods uh, during that period. There's no accounts of imports. They were, we were exporting agricultural goods. Mm. That's why they don't exactly. So the export statistics, obviously, um, uh, exports and imports are much easier to get because you know customs agents and border people maintain some records. Correct, correct. But they were not uh, exporting; uh, they were not importing things. Uh, so again, there's a, a whole other paper which looks at the value of total exports and current prices, which creates this time series using this historical record. So that's a whole separate paper. They take it from there. They have a, 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 another paper looking at, so these are all different authors. There's a share, so then they multiply the share of agricultural crops in the total exports, because again, the historical records are not fully complete. They don't record good by good. They just say this was the total amount exported from this border post in this year. So they make other estimates of the share of agricultural crops in the exports. They have to do some extrapolation and interpolation. For the 17th and 18th centuries, they assume that agricultural exports grow in line with domestic agricultural consumption. So they have sort of total exports. They say, well, we have the share at some point. We assume it grows at the same rate as domestic consumption. So they have to make some of these assumptions. That's what I said. Sometimes, maybe, who knows whether they're correct or not. But you have to make some assumption, otherwise you cannot come up with any, uh, anything. So this is uh, it's, uh, really on the better than nothing path. But these are all in current prices because that's how exports are recorded, right? We exported these many rupees worth of stuff. Then, so they have to then deflate by the agri an agricultural price index to get it in, to get sort of like a real, uh, real value of exports, again, based on the grain prices which they have already put together. 
So then, of course, then they add up the agricultural consumption and exports and get this agricultural output uh, series. And so they have to say, well, now that we get this series with all these assumptions in it, does it make any sense or is it consistent with other evidence? And that's when, again, as I said, they use the <laughs> any equity. Uh, so they say, based on our estimates with this methodology, they compared 1600 to 1910, and they said in 1910, agricultural production was 2.23 times the 1600 value. Okay? So then they say, is it, does it match with other estimates? So again, they look at the any equity, which was this comprehensive survey, and then the later crop surveys of 1910. So look how far apart they are. Uh, and they try to look at the same, uh, how much does agricultural output go up? And that, comparing those two sources, it comes to 2.28 times. So this is actually pretty close, um, for sure. So this gives them a lot more confidence in their methodology that we did it one way, we cross-checked with other sources, and it's uh, you know, relatively close. I was very happy for them. I said, wow, this is pretty nice. Uh, so notice, even just to make this comparison, you have to do many adjustments. So the any Akbari is only for the Mughal Empire. It's not for all India. So similarly, then you have to take the British crop surveys, which are from a bigger areas, take only the relevant parts, adjust it. So you know, it's behind that one number of 2.28, there's a month of work. <laughs> okay, that's the feature of economic of historical data, which you will find. So now that we got agricultural down, uh, they pay a lot of attention to this because this was the bulk of the economic activity at that period. So they're taking a lot of care for the other industry and services you'll see it's much more sketchy partly because it was a smaller share and therefore data is also much harder to come by but also this is going to make the biggest difference right this is the bulk of the economy if you get this wrong uh, it's going to make a huge difference to whatever conclusions you draw so then they're looking at industrial output they of course they here they're looking mostly at textiles that was the main industry there was not much else uh, in india at that time uh, they do a similar, very similar estimation of domestic demand. Okay, so they assume that there is a, something called a cloth wage, which is the daily wage rate divided by cloth prices. That's like your income uh, per capita income. Your demand for cloth is related to your per capita income with an elasticity of 0.5, not 0.4, a little bit more elastic, which makes sense because. You know, you can imagine that the demand for uh, clothing is a little more elastic than demand for food. Okay, still relatively inelastic here, but a little bit more elastic than uh, than the food. Uh, and so they do the same idea of cal calculating domestic cloth demand. They multiply with the population estimates. Then they add in the exports to Britain uh, and subtract out the imports from Britain because obviously the imports from Britain were a big deal in the later period. Okay. So they do that, and then they look at services output, where they divide into government services and private services. So here you'll notice how sketchy the estimation becomes. For government services, typically in GDP estimates, we just take total government expenditure as a measure of government service production. Right? That's our standard methodology. Of course, in that, those periods, in the historical periods, you didn't have government expenditure data. What you did have good track of was government revenues, right? So obviously that part, the governments were always uh, careful to maintain records and they collected so much taxes, etc. So they do get the total government revenues. They construct estimates of revenues per square mile, multiply by how much mile, square miles are in the area because you cannot get detailed revenue estimates from every part of India. It's a very large country. So they do that. Uh, the private services, they have zero data, okay, literally zero data because it was a very small part of the economy. So they just assume that private services are growing at the same rate as the urbanization share. So the idea is that urban economies are using more services, say transport and, or commerce or you know, uh, financial intermediation or things like that, uh, or you know, communication like messengers and so on. So they're use, assuming that the urban population is going to use more of these things and so they proxy it by the urbanization rate. So this is, again, as you can see, a pretty big assumption. In modern data, you do see a correlation between urbanization uh, and service sector output or uh, share of services and GDP. So it, there's correlation. But that's what they're going to do because there's otherwise literally zero data. Okay? This very, it doesn't make a big difference. You'll see the uh, shares later. So once they do all this, 
they construct these three time series. Yes, question. It was collected from somewhere, right? This is just to proxy, you want government expenditure, right? So the idea is that the government is providing, say, defense or roads or education or something. And how do you measure the value of that? In the modern data, we just take total government expenditure on all these things. Yeah, yeah, no, the, so the idea here is that revenue is equal to expenditure. That, that's another implicit assumption here. That government expenditure is equal to government revenue. Right? That is true of modern data as well. But the idea is, so we are not saying where it's funded from. Right? This is not that kind of uh, accounting. It's what is the production of goods and services. And so again, an assumption here is that all the revenue is spent on providing some services, which may not be true. right? Because some of the uh, you know, output, uh, some of the government revenue may be just, uh, I don't know, stolen, wasted, who knows? We, it's not clear that they will all be uh, used to provide services of some sort. So that's an assumption they're making. Yeah. Yeah, that's why I said, so the point four, they take a lot of work to justify. They look at modern studies of uh, predominantly agricultural societies and they look at what's the food demand elasticity with respect to income. They look at early modern European studies where the data is better, what kind of income they estimate. So there's no theory. They're looking at existing empirical work and picking a value. Hmm. Yeah. Our theory, all the theory would say is you know it's going to be pretty much inelastic. <laughs> That's about it. I think that late in the later period they have no data, right? So you need, they're constructing a time series here. At least I couldn't find it in the paper. When I was thinking there should be something else, but they don't have anything else. Huh? I think that was the, so we may be underestimating GDP here, yeah, for sure, okay? So we may be underestimating it. The other thing they do here, of course, remember in the GDP equation, it's not really output we are adding. We have to add value added. Right? That's the usual uh, output approach. We have to do agriculture value added plus industrial value added plus services value added, which means you have to subtract out the cost, the inputs, right? Now, you saw how difficult it was to construct output. Inputs is just impossible, okay? What they're doing, therefore, is they construct this time series of each sector relative to 1871, right? So you, they con construct an index number. The assumption again behind that index number is that inputs are some constant fraction of output. Now again, we, this may or may not be justified, right? But just, I'm just show, highlighting the difficulties of doing this, right? So if you assume that inputs are always a constant fraction uh, of the overall output, then the index number construction is not affected by considering only the output. Now again, this may not be true. Technology may be changing, methods of production may change, etc. But that's another inbuilt assumption in making these time series. So they make these um, indices, right? So that's where you'll notice all the tables in the paper are taking 1871 as 100, and then everything is with regard to that. Now, but when you want to combine them together into a GDP estimate, you have to uh, weight it. So that's what they say. Now we need to sum them up using the appropriate weights. What is the appropriate weight? Which is, it is the share of value added of each sector in GDP. That's how you're going to sum up these three indices. Okay. Uh, now, where are you going to get this share of uh, value, share of each sector in total value added? They want to pick 1871. They do not have good GDP estimates for 1871. The best earliest sectoral weights for India are from 1900. Okay. So that's what they have to take. That's the weights they're going to use. Again, nothing is perfect. So you have to realize the degree of imperfectness in these things is extremely high. And so they have to assume, uh, what do they assume? So they don't just take the weights from 1900 to their credit. They do a little bit of adjustment. So they assume that value added per employee in 1871 is the same as in 1900. And then they look at how many employees or how many people are working in each sector, project backwards to take the overall weight of that sector in value added. Okay, so they do a little bit of adjustment for the changing composition 
uh, of GDP. And then they make this uh, estimate. So finally, when they do, after doing all this, what do they come up with? Uh, is, so these weights imply that agriculture was 67.5% of their overall estimate, which makes sense. So agriculture was 67.5% of their total GDP. Industry was 22.2%. Services and housing was 8%. And the government services was 2.3%. Okay, that's what it finally ends up as. This is what you get. So after doing all these works, so remember, as I said, you have to work for months to get each of these numbers for each of these years and then aggregate them in this fashion. Be, and to their credit, they have been very, very clear about the assumptions. At each state, we are, this is what we're using. This is the earliest we can get. This is, you know, et cetera. Now, with all those caveats and assumptions, we do find something interesting at the end of it all. all right? This is, I just graphed their numbers. This is the blue line is agriculture, the red line is uh, industry and commerce, the green line is rent and services. These are the index numbers for each of the sectors. So you can notice that 1871, that last point is 100 for all of these things. Okay, so you're not going to compare them to each other, you're going to compare each line to itself. What we can see is one of the th key things you can see is that big fall in the red line, that is the industry. Okay. So the index of industrial output, so to speak, has shown a, an absolute fall, right? So there was a deindustrialization by their estimates. And it was a pretty big uh, uh, fall in industrial output. And this happened during the first three decades of the 19th century. Okay? And it was an absolute fall because this is just the index number of industrial production. It's not relative. So obviously, as a share of GDP, also it would have fallen. But this is uh, an absolute uh, decline. Okay. So in that sense, people who said there was a big deindustrialization in the initial period of colonial rule, they were right. There was a pretty big deindustrialization. The scale was not as large as some earlier authors have suggested, who suggested something like ever, the entire industry was wiped out. No, we were not completely wiped out, but it was a pretty big fall. So that one, that's one interesting thing you get out of this. The second thing you can see is that agriculture, look at the blue line, it's growing quite slowly. So it's been growing most of the period, but it's been growing quite slowly till about, you know, it's only sort of after 1820 uh, or something that it has a little bit of a faster growth rate. But for most of this period from 1600 till 1825, 1830, it's growing very, very slowly. And in fact, population growth was faster than this agricultural output growth. So it's not that agriculture declined, but it was not keeping up with, uh, with population growth. And so that's why, and that was the bulk of the economy. So agriculture is growing super slowly. Industry is actually falling in the last part, uh, in the beginning stages of colonial rule. Services sector is very small, right? So even if you add up everything, it's like 8 or 10% of the total GDP. So whatever happens there is not going to make a huge difference to overall GDP. And that's why when you do GDP per capita, you see this very steady decline, OK? And you can see this is, this is the overall GDP per capita index again. 1871 is 100. But compared to 1871 being 100, you can see that the 1600 value was 130. Okay, so GDP 200 years before, or 300 years before this, was 30% higher GDP per capita. So India has suffered an economic decline over this whole period. Okay? As I said, mostly not because GDP fell per se, but it grew very, very slowly. Industrial output fell, agriculture grew very slowly, population grew faster. So per capita was growing, uh, was actually falling. But the other interesting thing which comes out is that this decline starts in 1600. Okay, this is starting right there. It's not after the British come. Right? So in one sense, if you want to blame colonial rule for all our ills, you can blame them. But <laughs> it's, not the f it's not the full thing. You cannot blame the colonial powers for everything. Okay? So India was declining before it became a, a colony. So that's another, I think, important implication from this uh, to think about our history. Uh, how big is this scale? So even on an absolute scale, as you say, we decline, uh, the GDP per capita declined by 30% over these 300 years. This is at a time when countries like Britain were actually um, expanding very fast. So when you compare to that, the decline is horrendous. Right? So you look at this. Indian GDP per capita was uh, over 60% of the British level in 1600. By 1871, it has fallen to less than 15% of the British level. So we are falling in absolute terms, but in relative terms, we are really, really falling behind. Okay? 
But it also means that this uh, great divergence between the northern and western parts of Europe, that is, you know, in one sense, the UK comparison, and the rest of the world has become, begun earlier than the Industrial Revolution. So remember, the industri earliest dates of the Industrial Revolution are something like 1750. But the great divergence has begun well before that. So that is also an important uh, historical fact to understand uh, when we think about growth and development. Okay? And finally, they do a final comparison, which is they want to look at something like absolute poverty levels. Now, this requires an additional level of uh, uh, assumptions where they're comp now going to convert that GDP per capita index into 1990 international dollars. So for that, they have to say, well, what does this mean? What was, so you have to pick some unit, some rupee somewhere. So they pick something like the, uh, you can pick the Mughal era, any Akbari estimate of rupees 6.57 per capita GDP. I think that's what they use, but they can use a different value as well, I think from a later period. This is, so this, uh, this is sort of per annual per capita GDP in 1990 international dollars. That also shows a decline, as you might expect. That is not surprising. What they want to do is look, compare the absolute levels of it. So they say during the Mughal era in the 1600s, you had something like 650, 660 dollars per capita per year. Okay, so when you think about the dollar a day, poverty line, which is now con considered extreme poverty, that would be something like $365, $400 a year is extreme poverty. So India was well above extreme poverty levels. You're at 650, et cetera. Okay? By the time you come to the end of the period, 1851, you are much closer to the absolute poverty levels. Right? So there's a big decline uh, over there. So I think the main thing is uh, that's, that big decline is there. The main reason they wanted to do this is to uh, place a counterpoint to earlier estimates like Madison's series. If people have studied economic history, would see use Madison's data a lot, which is a huge cross-country data set over many centuries. So you can imagine how many uh, errors would be in that estimate. But they show that for India, these estimates are badly flawed because the Madison estimates uh, assume that India was, show that India was close to subsistence throughout this entire 300-400 year period, and their estimates say no, India was not always so poor. It was relatively unpoor uh, in the earlier period, and then we reached close to subsistence levels. <coughs> okay? Questions? Comments? Yes? Uh, the findings that, uh, isn't it because it Now, this is always a problem. This will come to in the last paper on Egypt because one of the things is, is it political instability which drives the economic decline, or is it economic decline which drives the political instability? Like Correct. We see them both happening at the same time, but which causes which we cannot say. It could be that this you know lack of control and the breakup of the empire causes this slow progress. It could be the other way around. In fact, the last paper on Egypt is trying to understand this link. Okay. But yeah, they happen at the same time, so you can, you know, with these data, you cannot tell which, which way it goes. Yeah. So what did they argue that about uh, early divergence? Maybe they are questioning well established areas of yes. economic history. Correct. So built over the last 50 years. Correct. It's very hard work. Yes. So, what are their cases of this early divergence? That's a good yeah. question. Yes, I don't know yet. I will ask Vishnu when I meet her. <laughs> I'm meeting her later this week. So <laughs> I'll tell her, I read your paper, but this is a great. But exactly. So I do not know what her for their theory would be of why the great divergence started so much earlier. So I think this is, as you said, it's, an, it's a key input as to why, as to, to know when it started, is to know uh, is, is to for the causes. Right? So you cannot say it was all the Industrial Revolution. Right? Clearly, some of it started before the Industrial Revolution. Maybe the initial divergence caused the Industrial Revolution. Right? Maybe you need a certain level of uh, prosperity to be able to engage in the Industrial Revolution. Right? Maybe you need a certain amount of capital. Maybe. So these are, let me come to this in a second. 
lots of people have been theorizing about this. As you said, there's a very large literature, right, on why the Industrial Revolution happened. And let's talk a little bit about it, right? So why did Europe grow faster? This theories and theories and theories. There are many, many volumes written about it. Maybe it's just luck, which is not a very satisfying explanation. Uh, I'm giving a highlight of some kinds of theories. So some people have emphasized geography. Okay? And if people have not read this book, I strongly recommend it. This is a book by Jared Diamond. It's called Guns, Germs, and Steel. It's a really a very well-written book. Uh, and he's trying to explain the long-run dominance of Eurasian civilizations over others. So in a sense, why did Europeans colonize America rather than the other way around? That's the question he's motivated by. And he says uh, it, there were lots of geographical advantages that Europe and Asia, Eurasia, enjoyed. For instance, they had a lot more easily domesticated animal species like cows and sheep, which they could use for both agricultural purposes and for food purposes. And they had things like an east-west continental axis. So these are geographical attributes. This really helped the first civilizations to be formed in Eurasia and then develop to a level where they could go and colonize other uh, areas of the world. Of course, these were determined 11,000 years ago. So then, you know, the, but the great divergence we are saying maybe started at 1800, maybe started a little bit before. We're not talking about 11,000 years ago. Does this really still explain what started in 1600 or maybe 1800? Other people have also used the geography hypothesis in a different way. So Jeffrey Sachs has a very influential paper saying, well, malaria is a big part of it. The parts of the world which are affected by malaria are not able to grow uh, as much because people cannot be as productive. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about this Nan and Puga paper, which is a very nice paper and it casts a lot of doubt in this whole geography hypothesis because they say, well, geography is something, but history matters uh, for how geography works. There's a lot of work on this cultural hypothesis, right? So some people have, why did Europe pull ahead, right? Why did the Great Divergence start with Europe going ahead of the other areas? Some people have, um, have emphasized things like the Protestant work ethic. Abner Greif has a nice paper talking about individualist versus collectivist norms of contract enforcement. How do you set up? your ways of doing business or economic activity. Joel Mokir, who's a very famous economic historian, has a whole book about the Enlightenment in England, where he, which, he, which he says was a precursor to the Industrial Revolution. What does he mean by the Enlightenment? He means that thinking through reason and logic rather than you know, metaphysics or religion-based thinking, which was the prior norm that whatever happens is God's will and you justify it in, with very different types of theories, but a little more observational, more reason-based, etc. That kind of thinking change took place, and that's what enabled the Industrial Revolution uh, to happen. That's his claim. So there have been many, many books, as you say, written on this. Mm. So that this part would fit with the early divergence, right? Because his thesis is that you needed this kind of uh, change in thinking and attitude before you could become industrialized. Douglas North, who's a Nobel Prize winner, has emphasized a totally different thing. He emphasizes what are called institutions. Okay? Uh, and what does he mean by institutions? He says, well, institutions are the incentive structure of societies. These are the humanly devised constraints that structure human interaction. That's the broad definition. This includes things like formal constraints, like rules or laws or constitutions, informal constraints like conventions, norms of behavior, and how these constraints are enforced. Okay? Some people call it just the rules of the game, to be very short. Now, this sounds very broad, a bit vague, for sure. It's not very precise. But it does rule out factors like geography or work ethic. Right? It, does, it's, it doesn't say anything. It's actually different from culture. It doesn't say it's, it's, it has a little bit of overlap, but it basically says, it's, a, it's not geography and it's not some God-given advantages because these are humanly devised rules of human interaction. Now, personally, I like this explanation because it's a very optimistic explanation, right? Because it means that growth is achievable by all societies. You don't have to be born in a particular religion or in a particular region with the, this particular geographical or other attributes. Uh, you, even if you have malaria, you can uh, become uh, rich. I think that's a, it's a positive message. Now, the question is, does it have weight? Does it help? Yes. But is it culture That's right. No, so exactly. So the question is, how do you define culture? What is culture? It's a 
So I said, at least things, it rules out this, if you believe that explanation, rules out things like the Protestant work ethic, that you should all be a, belong to the Protestant religion. Okay, it rules out certain types of culture, but not all. That's why I said it, it's a little bit loose definition, but it at least doesn't say that. So it depends on what kind of rules of the, that religion imposes, right? It doesn't mean that. So what I'm saying, it doesn't depend on which god you worship, but how you do things. The how you do, do part is part of the institutions, so, but it doesn't depend on which one you worship, so to speak. Yeah. That's why I said there's some there's some overlap. Right, but it's, it's not the Protestant work ethic. You can have work ethic without the Protestant label on it. So it rules out certain types of explanation, not others. So, yeah. I mean, basically, there's, a, there's this paper by Mikhailopoulos which talks about the origins of Islam. Correct, correct. Built upon the fact that in Arab regions, Islam is an Let me show you. Let me show you a couple of papers where exactly we're trying to do that. Okay? Yeah. So do institutions affect growth? Right? You want to see whether it affects growth or not, and if so, which institutions are important? Because it's such a big term, right? Which ones are important? That's the hard part. This is the part where there's still lots of active research happening. We do not yet know which ones are the important ones. Okay? This is a paper which some of you may have read. This is, I just summer, put an acronym, Asamoglu Johnson Robinson. How many of you have seen this paper? Yeah, fair amount, fair number of you have seen this paper. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on it. Uh, just talk a little bit about what they do. Asamoglu Johnson Robinson, they emphasize the institution of private property. So they say if a country or a society can guarantee the protection of private property rights, that's really going to generate a lot of investment and a lot of growth in that society. And they do this wonderful graph where the, on the x-axis you have what they call average expropriation risk, which is how secure your property is. So it's a, it's a ranking of countries on a scale of uh, 1 to 10. If you are a 10, that means private property is very well protected in your country and you people cannot, you know, other people cannot seize your property, etc. You have a well-functioning court system and so on. And if you are at the low end, it means that your private property is not particularly safe uh, or secure. And, what, and then they have that index, and they look at on the uh, y-axis, they have the log GDP per capita in 1995. They find this very strong positive correlation between the two, saying, well, you know, private property definitely. The question is, does private property lead to higher GDP, or is it that rich countries are better able to protect private property. That's always the hard part. Which way does the causation go? Uh, and in their paper, they do something quite innovative. Uh, they look at uh, what they call, what is it? Early settler mortality. Right? If somebody remembers the paper, you should summarize it for me. Can I get a volunteer to ask, summarize the paper? Yeah, tell us. Mm -hmm. So the idea there is if when the early European settlers went to particular areas, if they found that the climate condition, it's a variation of the geography hypothesis, but mediated by institutions. If they found that the geographical conditions are so bad, like this place has a lot of yellow fever, cholera, et cetera, and we are dying in large numbers, then they wouldn't want to settle there. And so they would not put in any good rules of protecting private property there because you know we're not going to be there for very long because it's very hard to live there. That was their thesis, while in other places where the weather or other conditions were more suitable for Europeans to settle, they took the time and trouble to put in good rules and uh, private property protections. And so that's what they used to get around this endogeneity problem. Is it 
private property causing economic growth or the other way around. Okay? But that's their paper, that's a cross-country paper, which was very interesting for me when I drew the graph from their paper. Look at India. Okay? India is very far away from that best fit line. Okay, so for in, in one sense, what does that mean? It means that India has, on this ranking of institutions on the x-axis, very good institutions, or very good systems of protecting private property. And yet, we are, we are not as rich as this thing would predict. I guess it was very, um, so I was a bit motivated by this. I said, oh, what is going on here? Why is India so far away? Why, you know, do we look, why do we look so different? So what matters in India? Is it the same thing or is it something else? So I'll briefly go through the Banerjee and Iyer paper where we're looking at variation in historical institutions within India. Right? So that was, in that graph, India was one data point, but we know India is a very large country. Uh, and obviously, lots of things are different in different parts of India. So, so that's what we wanted to do, do some comparisons across different regions uh, of India. So we are doing a within country analysis rather than the cross country analysis. Is this better, worse? Thoughts? It's just different, but is it better or worse? Right? Correct. There's less, with less, all sorts of other things vary across countries. So at least here it's all within one country. That's one plus point, right? So you're comparing at least some things which are similar across these places. Any downsides of doing that? That's a good thing in the sense you're cutting down the omitted variables bias by looking within a country rather than across the whole globe. Any other, any downsides to doing this? I mean, you can't generalize this Right, right. So the results may be relevant only for this country. You may have to worry about that, right? So as I said, it's different. It has pros, it has cons. It's, it's still, I think, useful to do. Uh, what, what did we, we want to compare? We were comparing these historical institutions, which is the British land tenure systems across different parts of India. So we know that you know, the British put in things like uh, the zamindari system in many places in India, which includes Bengal and Bihar, some parts of Madras presidency, uh, etc. Okay, so those are the lighter uh, shaded areas here. In other parts of India, which is the dark gray, they actually put in a quite different system, which is called the Rayatwadi system. Right? And there, it was not that you had a big zamindars who were responsible for land revenue. So you have to remember why these systems were there. The primary source of tax revenue for Brit the British and all previous rulers of India was land revenue, okay? land tax. Uh, so when I was doing this work, I justified watching the movie Lagan by saying, I'm working. <laughs> so anyway. So they, were, uh, so they had to put in some arrangement for collecting this revenue. Because remember, there were very few British people in India, and they were trying to rule over this huge uh, land mass, and they had to make sure to how to collect this revenue. So they had made these different arrangements, and in some areas they had appointed a few big landlords and saying, you landlord are responsible for getting me the land tax from this particular area. This is how much you need to deliver to me. This is your responsibility. I don't care how you get it, but you need to do that. In other places, like the Bombay Presidency uh, and some parts of South India, they did the Rayatwadi system where actually it was no, they didn't have big zamindars. They actually went to mostly to individual cultivators and told them, well, you are an individual cultivator. This is your land. Uh, and you are responsible for such and such an amount of revenue. You need to deliver to me at, at tax time. Okay? So it was not so much about whether private property is protected better or worse. It is how the property is distributed. Right? Is it, so basically about inequality. Is one person responsible for large chunks of land or is it lots of people responsible for little chunks of land? Okay? The Mahalwari system, this is what I'm labeling village here, the Mahalwari system in um, Uttar Pradesh and Punjab and so on was a kind of in-between thing. So they had something like a village council to be in charge of the revenue for that village. And that's, this is what we struggled with in that paper to actually <laughs> how to classify this weird system, which is sort of in between, uh, because obviously if the village body consists of one person, that looks like a landlord system. Well, if the village body consists of pretty much most people in the village, it's closer to the Rayatwari system. So it was a very, you know, we struggled a little bit to define it uh, properly. That's why I've marked it separately anyway, 
In our analysis, we do some robustness checks where we dropped those places and so on because they're a little bit hard to classify. And so that's what we're looking. We're looking at how widespread is the ownership of property. We were looking at agricultural productivity and investments, but in the post-independence period, okay, because we don't have very detailed data. I'll show you some data from the colonial period, but we're looking in the mostly in the post-independence period. Uh, and so the important thing is we're looking at a pure institutional overhang. Right? So in independent India, Zamindari was outlawed. Of course, we can argue about how well these laws were, uh, were, were implemented. There were lots of land reform laws passed, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the institutions, in that sense, have been officially dismantled. And in fact, a lot of, most of agricultural income is not taxed anymore. So in fact, the whole land revenue system uh, is also a historical artifact. But then does it shape uh, modern day outcomes? This is what we did. We did a regression. We put variables, things like how much area was irrigated, fertilizer use, how many high yielding varieties of seeds you, uh, you sowed, etc. Those are our outcome variables. We regress them on what is called the non-landlord proportion. Okay? What do I mean by non-landlord proportion? If your area was, this is the district level data. If your area was completely zamindari, your non-landlord proportion was, ze was zero. If you were completely rayatwadi, your non-landlord proportion was one. There were places which were in between. So they were genuinely in between in the sense that you would have some zamindari villages and some rayatwadi villages. Uh, and that happened a lot in Madras presidency because they used to have some old holdover zamindars, but then the later put in place the right wire system. So you actually had fractions, right? Similarly, in Uttar Pradesh, in most districts, you had fractions. You'd have, you know, 30% of the villages are held under zamindari and 20% under right wari and 50% under mahalwari. They would give all these things. Now, where do we get the data? That was the hard part, as in all historical analysis. Uh, how do we get these fractions, right? So we got district level land settlement reports from the 1870s. So this was you know, fairly late in the sense that these systems had been well established by then. The British commissioned these reports for every district where the, an officer would go and write a 200 page report about that district. And they would describe everything, the geography, the local customs, the festivals, the they even had things like, some of them would have the lyrics of the popular wedding songs. Uh, they had all kinds of things in those reports, right? And somewhere in the middle of the 200 pages, they would have a t little table saying, out of the whatever, you know, 1,000 villages in this district, 265 are held under Zamindari, and 348 are held under Rayatwari, et cetera, OK? So that was my job. I had to sit and read the 200 pages for each district to find that number. OK, that's, how, that's what it takes to do historical data. All right, so that took many, many months, as you can imagine. But that's how we get our district level data. OK? And so that, but it's important because we know that it's many districts were not 100% one or the other. So we, could, we can actually run this regression on a more continuous variable. And the main thing to note is what we get. If you look at the first column, you get uh, you basically find that areas which have more non-landlord tenure, which had, in fact, in the historical period, in the post-independence period, they have higher irrigation, more fertilizer use, more areas under high yielding varieties. So they're taking up the green revolution technologies, et cetera. Uh, and of course, as you may expect as a result of this, you look at the column one here again, they have uh, significantly higher crop yields. Obviously, if you do more irrigation and more fertilizer and more high-yielding varieties, you have uh, more crop yields. But these areas are significantly more productive. The main thing is the size of the productivity differential is pretty large. If you look at single crops, right, you can just look at wheat yields. Uh, the non-landlord areas are about 23% higher yields. Right? This is yield per hectare. So this is a really huge differential. So that means if you go from 0% non-landlord of complete zamindari to complete rayatwari, you have 23% higher uh, wheat yields, OK? The other columns are little, um, don't have to worry too much about them. We're just doing many, many robustness checks to check that this is not driven by this or that. So we excluded things like Bengal and Bihar, because those were the first uh, areas which were colonized, uh, sort of administered by the British. Maybe that drives everything. It's not the Bengali zamindars. 
We also excluded things like the village-based districts, which, is, which involves actually dropping a large part of our sample. But we were unsure about the classification, so we tried dropping those. And you will see that things like the fertilizer, differential, et cetera, remains uh, even after you drop those things. OK? Now, the, of course, you can imagine that this is just a correlation analysis. It's a cross-sectional analysis. You can think of many different possibilities of uh, omitted variables bias about why certain areas got certain land tenure systems, right? So maybe there's some other characteristics of those areas. Uh, maybe only places with certain types of uh, altitude got certain types of land tenure systems. So one of the things we did, of course, is that we control for as many things as possible. We control for latitude and altitude and soil type and uh, whether you're on the coast and all kinds of uh, things that you can do. But then you can keep on thinking of more and more <laughs> uh, omitted variables. So you can do this to some extent. What we show, actually, is that this positive correlation between being non-landlord and agricultural productivity did not always exist. Okay, so it's not that it's, so at least you can say that time invariant omitted variables cannot explain this relationship. So it's not some geography thing. Because geography in that sense is time invariant. It's not at least the crude geographical variables uh, which, will, which are driving this relationship. And I can show you that in a little bit. So this is in the post-colonial period. These are wheat yields, right, on the y-axis. This is that proportion on landlord and the x-axis. You can see a positive relationship. That was what we were showing in the earlier regressions. We got this data on Uttar Pradesh wheat yields in the 1870s. Okay? And here you can see the exact opposite relationship. Right? So in the 1870s, in the earlier period, it was the landlord areas which were much more productive. This makes sense with, other, with the theorizing about these things, because usually they say a landlord system means you have uh, many intermediaries, right? You have the cultivator, and then you have a landlord, and then you have the state. So the output from that area has to be enough to sustain both the cultivator and the landlord, right? A landlord-based system is feasible only in areas with kind of above average output. Otherwise, you just, you know, if, this, if everybody's at subsistence, you cannot support a landlord. And this actually makes sense here, because the landlord areas were more productive uh, during the colonial period. So at least this helps to knock out the geography uh, hypothesis that it's not really geography. So one is you just control for it, but also this should remain the same over time if it was geography. It does not. Okay. So what, the other thing we do to rule out these kind of omitted variables bias is think of an instrumental variable. Okay which is, now this is the hard part always, the instruments are very hard to come by. So you want to find something which uh, affected just the land tenure arrangements, but not other things, right? That's always hard. We did, I think we have a reasonably good instrument. What we used is the fact that there was a lot of change in the thinking about land tenure systems uh, by the British administrators in India. So when the British first came and, the, and they took over the administration of Bengal and Bihar, they mostly did landlord systems uh, for two reasons. One is there were already some zamindars. And they said, oh, well, these guys have been doing this. Let's co-opt them. right? Let's uh, make them part of our system. Uh, the other part is, of course, a landlord system is cheaper in the sense that the British, given that they were numerically very small and they didn't have a huge state apparatus set up, they have to deal with only a few number of people. They don't have to go to every individual cultivator and try to figure out how much tax to collect from each person, which this is a very time consuming uh, enterprise. And they didn't have the uh, manpower or the resources to do that. You need a much better functioning state, a much more capacious state to do that. And so at the beginning of the period, they didn't have that. So the landlord system was the easy way to go. Over time, what happened was some British administrators argued that the individual cultivator system would be better. So in particular, Thomas Munro of Madras presidency, he was the governor there. He said, I want to do this individual cultivator system. I think this is going to be much better because it gives the cultivator much better incentives to work on the land than if he has to give everything to an extractive landlord. So this will be better for agricultural productivity. He got a lot of pushback. So the Madras presidency was already under a zamindari system. So he got a lot of pushback from other people. And in fact, when you read some of their debates, it's quite interesting. They literally had a principal agent model in their head. They didn't do it with math like we do now. 
but they were making the same arguments. They talked about risk aversion. They are sort of saying, well, investments require some risk taking and a cultivator at a subsistence level, no matter how good his incentives are, is not going to be able to bear that risk. They talked about capital constraints. They said if you have to do big investments like irrigation or other types of land improvements, only a large landlord with a significant amount of capital at his disposal can make those, uh, can make those investments. And so if you give all the property rights to individual cultivators, you'll get zero investment because none of them are, there's a there's, they're t literally talking about model with threshold effects. There's a threshold you need to cross before you can invest and none of these people are going to make it. <laughs> so it, they didn't, as I said, the, the arguments are pretty sophisticated from, you know, you're reading this text from 1805 and they're making this, so it, I don't know, I don't know whether it's good or bad. I think it was good. Uh, it was a little sad uh, that, well, we, as economists, we're making the same arguments people made in 1805. <laughs> Have we learned nothing? I mean, I think we've learned to do them maybe better, but you know, the, the gist of it was there. So the point is he got a lot of pushback. He got a lot of actually, you know, credible arguments from other people in the administration saying why the landlord system would be better. Uh, yeah. So you're not anyway going to the individual. That is the choice you have to make. Yeah, so Whether to go to the individual or appoint a landlord who will be your intermediary to go to the individual. I'm just thinking in the terms of where you would like to have the system. So if individual owns land, mostly land is owned by individuals, then appointing a landlord is troubling thing. No, this is the problem. You see what I mean? Ownership was a very difficult concept, especially in the historical period. Right? Mm -hmm. Most people didn't have any documents to say we own this land. Right? So we have been cultivating this land. Um, you know, Hamara Dada, Bardada have been cultivating this land. Right? Do you own it? No, but later on, these same producers, when they come with all these uh, kind of land record system, they get those same rights that kind of. They gave ownership. ownership. That's the point. Yeah. That is the point. They gave ownership. You see what I mean? The point is the choice of this land tenure system effectively translated into ownership. Because especially in the Rayatwadi areas, right, they gave patas to people saying, this is the land you, we, the British state say that you own and you owe us revenue of so much, so much. They codified ownership. So we're not talking about pre-existing system, which there may have been. What I'm saying is the British state, the British administrators had a choice to make about who they would recognize as having rights on the land. So I'm saying this ownership is endogenous to the process of setting up these systems. No, no, but that's exactly what I'm saying. What was ownership before? Right? What is ownership even now? Ownership is what is recognized by the state. How do you know you own something? Right? So some of it is determined. So definitely in Bengal, for sure, it was determined by this. They found a few zamindars. Oh, this guy's already there. Let's continue the system. So in some areas, for sure, that was the, the case. In other areas, so for instance, in central provinces, they didn't find any zamindars. But they said, we must do the zamindari system. We are going to appoint them. We are going to create zamindars when they cannot be found. That was officially a phrase in their document. So in some areas, they took sort of continued, so to say, the pre-existing system. And in some areas, they said, no, we are going to change it. You see what I mean? So it varies. It's a choice. It was a choice they had to make, and they could choose to continue the pre-existing ownership or whatever structure you had, or change it. Hmm. Yeah. Question. Revenue. Of course, revenue. They don't care about agricultural productivity, but of course, if it is the land becomes more productive, then they can get more revenue. 
right? So they, they indirectly they care about agricultural productivity. So they had two basic big objectives, or rather three. One was maximize land revenue. Second was maximize the stability of the land revenue. They didn't want the land, the, the amount of revenue they get to fluctuate wildly year after year because that just makes life difficult for the administration. And the third thing they wanted is <laughs> to avoid rebellions. So they didn't, they didn't want to tax so much that it would cause a large scale revolt. So that was their sort of three big objectives. Mm. But yes, you're right, some places they continued pre-existing systems. But it was a choice, it was always, a, you see what I mean? It's not that they automatically always did that. And especially in Madras, you can see the struggle. They said, this is, we're not going to do it. We have already appointed these landlords, it's all done, finished, you know. What is this new Rayatwadi business you're talking about? No way. So this guy, Thomas Munro actually went to England and he lobbied the court of directors of the East India Company and he got an order passed from London saying that, oh, in Madras presidency, you have to do the Rayatwadi system. Okay? And this is obviously a very sort of one of the exogenous changes, so to speak. It's not determined by conditions on the ground. Somebody in London took the decision for the whole province. Of course, they had, and people in Madras were not happy. They said, but we already made these landlords. And so they said, well, you have given them a term of something like five years or 10 years. You are the landlord, and this is what the revenue owes us for the next five years and 10 years. This is the kind of contracts they had been given. When that contract expires, you have to convert this area to Rayatwadi. So Madras was a big change. It's one of the provinces which switched. Okay? Bengal never switched, right? They remained on the permanent settlement till. I don't know when, until independence, I guess. Yes, yes. So it's very interesting. You can see the objective was to increase land revenue. And so it's because in areas of permanent settlement, the land revenue is fixed. No matter what happens to agricultural productivity, the British state is going to get the same thing. So it's quite interesting that in Bengal, they did not even do this district by district uh, settlement reports. They did not even bother to do these detailed surveys like they did in all the other areas. because. Like, it makes no difference to us. Why should we even bother to learn? Because the, our revenue is fixed. Anyway, so one of the thing we are using is that the point is that in 1820, there were these two big changes. One is Madras switched in 1820 from uh, landlord to Rayatwadi systems. And in 1820, there was a very famous document. Now, I'm forgetting the name of the gentleman. It's there in the paper in, in the northwestern provinces, which is modern UP, where he said, I don't want the Zamindari system. I want this village-based system. And he was very influential. He got that passed for his area. So what we're saying, well, in 1820, there was this big switch in thinking on the part of individual administrators, which was backed up by London, to switch to the Rayatwari system. And you can actually see in the data that places uh, we, so that's what we're going to use, the places which were conquered after 1820, they all were mostly Rayatwari or Mahalwari. They were, non -land, they were not Zamindari. So for instance, Elphinstown in Bombay presidency explicitly said, I'm very impressed by Thomas Munro in Madras. I'm going to follow his Rayatwari system. So it was, this 1820, in a sense, we think is a key date because it set this precedence, which later places uh, relied on to put in non-landlord systems. That, of course, so that's what we're arguing, that the historical circumstances are very supportive for non-landlord arrangements to be adopted. Uh, the problem, of course, that was that in 1856, there was a big reversal. So Awad was annexed in 1856, right? And in fact, just like all the other areas, the plan was to do a Mahalwari settlement there. They said, okay, we are like all the rest of Northwestern provinces, we are going to do this, we are not going to have these landlords anymore. But you know, of course, what happened in 1857, right? Big mutiny happened in 1857. A lot of the talukdars of Awad, the big zamindars, supported the mutiny. Right? Because they knew they were going to get this Mahalwari system. They had every incentive to oppose the British. The British, it took them almost two years to actually put down the mutiny across different parts of India, after which they got really, really scared. Because they said one of their big objectives was to avoid this rebellion. They said, oh my God, if we now do this Mahalwari settlement here, now that peace has been restored, what do we do with this newly annexed province? If we do the Mahalwari system here, we are, this is too risky, we are not going to do it. So they actually reversed their own decision and said, we're going to put them in, keep the zamindars. Okay, so that's why we say 1856 was a switch back. 
So, the instrument we are going to use is well, if you were annexed into the British Empire in between 1820 and 1856, you were very likely to get a, a, a non zamindari system, uh, while if you were uh, in other periods, you would get, you were more likely to get a zamindari system. So, that is our instrument, it is a non linear instrument, right? So, we are not saying that later parts of the British Empire got this or that because there was this reversal. So, it is not just uh, so, it's not, so, we can control for the direct effect of a longer period of British rule and still use this nonlinearity. Okay? So, that is the instrument we use. If you look at this, let me just explain. Uh, the bold line is the non landlord proportion. Right? So, you can see the bold line, this is 1820, this is 1856. You can see this big spike in that bold line. That is the increased probability of getting a non landlord system in that relevant period. This big hump before is Madras. That is the one which switched. Madras was conquered much earlier, but they switched in 1820. They are not part of our instrument. Okay? In fact, for them our instrument is zero because they were conquered earlier, but they were the one who set the precedent. Okay? The interesting thing is when you look at the uh, log yields, that is the dotted line or the dashed line, you see a very similar nonlinear pattern. Okay? So, if it was all driven by you know, greater length of British rule, you should not see some this kind of nonlinear pattern. The point is it matches this trend in non-landlord systems very nicely. And that is our instrumental variable strategy which we use here. So, again notice that it comes directly from history. The instrumental strategy here, uh, instrumental variable strategy comes not from geography or something like that, but it comes from reading lots of historical documents. And this is what you get, this is the advantage you get if you wallow in the archives <laughs> for a long time. <laughs> yeah. Uh, from 1800 to 1820, yeah. in that 20 years period, yeah. the yield has reduced drastically as compared to changing land system. Yes. The mm. land holding pattern from Jamindari who went ahead with the right body. Correct. That is when the yield has dropped It right. dropped a little bit. So, these are different, this is it is not a time series really, it is different areas are getting conquered at different times. This is the date of conquest. Okay? So, in one sense that dip is mostly driven by central provinces which were mostly conquered during that period. They got a zamindari system, that is why you see the dip in the non landlord part and they are also super unproductive. Right? What we are saying is that the fact that you are following the same non linear pattern means it is not just length of British rule, it is it is following the pattern of the institutional uh, systems of British rule. Okay. Yeah. Oh, they were all different. So, I have a whole other paper on doctrine of lapse, which we can talk about in Ofsaz if you want. A, I have a whole other paper on it. These were all annexations by different means. Are, we are putting in all of them together here. All right. So, this is the, just the first stage. I, you can just see that the first stage is significant. If you are conquered between 1820 and 1856, you are much more likely to get a non landlord system. You can do the same uh, instrumental variable estimates, uh, and you can find you know, the effects we found earlier on things like fertilizer use, high yielding varieties, uh, yields of rice and wheat are all, uh, in, in fact, the coefficient estimates are bigger in magnitude with the instrumental variables, at least it helps us to say that it is not all other, it is not just omitted variables which are driving our relationship, we do these different ways of controlling for omitted variables, uh, mostly it seems to match up. So, I think the main interesting thing is of course, let me find, uh, let me talk about the implications of this. Right? So, what does this mean, especially compared to the Asamoglu Johnson Robinson, it means that you know, it does not just matter how well defined the property rights are. Property rights are well defined in both the Rayatwari system and the, and the Zamindari system. right? You had legal systems to protect private property, you had British common law, etc. But it does matter how widely distributed property is. It does seem to matter for subsequent uh, outcomes. And then you can actually observe the importance of historical institutions, not just cross country, but also within country. One of the interesting things we found, as I know showed you before, is that in the, in the colonial period, the landlord areas were more productive. So, this gap, this positive effect of having non landlord systems comes after these systems have been dismantled, which is a little puzzling. We, we thought we would find a big gap in the colonial period and it would go away. <laughs> after independence, we found exactly the opposite. We found the gaps widening at the time when the Green Revolution was coming in. 
we found this, we find this big opening up of this gap. Uh, so this non-landlord areas were somehow able to take up the green revolution and associated technologies, right? You need good irrigation, you need fertilizer, et cetera, to make use of these uh, than the landlord areas. You had a question? Did you have a question? No. So that's one of the things we were, uh, we've been wondering about exactly why that happened. So there was a much bigger take up uh, in, of uh, green revolution in non-landlord areas. We do find that uh, so one of our hypotheses is, well, maybe the landlord areas were distracted, so to speak, by trying to dismantle the landlord systems. I mean, you do find that states which had a lot of zamindari system, they pass a lot more land reform and anti-zamindari bills and land redistribution bills, blah, blah, blah. So maybe they're spending their political capital on doing these kind of things, which also were demanded by uh, the people. And they, be, they spend much less on development expenditure. So we do find a big gap uh, in development expenditure spending, which includes things like agricultural extension services. Uh, so maybe they were too busy doing land reform, not enough doing uh, green revolution, take up and encouragement. That's one hypothesis. So maybe part of the explanation is the cost of the effort to dismantle the historical institutions. This is the part where we're not fully sure. We do find a strong relationship. We're not fully sure exactly why. Uh, there may be other channels. Right? You can think about uh, investments and when will inequality matter for investments. There are many models of inequality and growth, which I cannot summarize here. There are literally many, many models, and they can generate all kinds of predictions. So you can think about you know, whether the investments are small or large. That will matter for whether inequality matters or not. Uh, you can think about you know, who will save more. Will the rich save more than the poor? That matters for investment, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, Theoretically, what I'm saying is it's actually also a little confusing to know when and how inequality will matter. It's much easier to argue when will security of property rights matter. That's a easier to have a conceptual or theoretical thinking, but inequality has, has multiple channels. You can generate uh, many different implications. So it's not a very easy thing to understand exactly why historical inequality matters for later investments. Hmm. The other thing we do, we do find is that, you know, one other hypothesis, this is my co-author Abhijit Banerjee's uh, preferred hypothesis, is well, I think his, his claim is that society is very polarized in former zamindari areas. There's a big class divide, and that translates into a lot more uh, conflict of different types. So people are not working together, there's a lot of distrust, and that's why maybe you're not able to increase overall productivity. We do find that the landlord areas have higher rates of crime for what, for what it's worth, <laughs> but I don't know whether that uh, proves this hypothesis or not. So what I want to do before, well, I want to show you two sort of potential generalizations of, and which can help to shed light on why these things matter in the long run. So our paper suggests that initial conditions of economic inequality can have this long run effects. Is this generalizable? And in what direction? Do they all go in the same direction? Uh, there's, there was contemporary work by Sokolov and Engerman who looked at uh, North and South America, so overall in the Americas. And what they found, interestingly, is that there were lots of variation in the long run outcomes of colonies of the same colonial power. So they looked, for instance, there's a beautiful comparison they do of Barbados versus the United States, which were both British colonies. The US is, of course, one of the richest countries in the world today, and Barbados is I don't know where. Uh, so, but that's the point they said. But in 1600, in the initial process of colonization, Barbados was much, much, much richer than the United States. That, that's, the, that, that's their contribution. They put together this historical data and said, wow, this place was really rich. And what happened to that place? Right? And they were both British colonies. So it's not that, you know, it's not like a British versus French colony type of thing. They were both British colonies and they had very different fates. So that's what they find a big reversal of fortune between what they call sugar colonies and non-sugar colonies. Barbados was a sugar colony. Uh, and the United States, some parts grew sugar, but obviously they grew many other things as well. So this is their data, which they put together. And this was very painstakingly collected uh, historical data from many different countries. Uh, and again, you can look, that, look at that. This is GDP per capita relative to the United States. You can see Argentina, for instance, in the 1800 was as rich as the United States. Okay. And by the time you come to 1997, Argentina's GDP per capita is only 35%, one third uh, of the United States. Okay? And similarly, you can see Cuba was 67% richer than the US. 
in the early colonial period. And of course, Cuba is nowhere close uh, today. In fact, they don't even have good statistics in the later period to compare. Uh, yeah. Sorry? Barbados, exactly. Barbados is 50% richer than the US. And by the time you come to 1997, Bar the US is 50% richer than Barbados. It's a complete reversal. Right? That's what they were documenting, that look, these paths of, of uh, progress have been very uneven. It's not that places which are rich today were always rich. This is, uh, people have, their places have gone through these different cycles. Places which start super rich can end up super poor. Um, yes, we saw the decline in India, right? This is, this is published very many years ago. What their, their hypothesis, right? Their hypothesis is that it is the labor institutions which really matter. It's about, again, about inequality, but sort of in the labor market. Their hypothesis is that the economies that specialized in the production of crops associated with slavery, those are the places which had very high GDP per capita incomes in the 1700s. Sugar was a very valued commodity, okay? And it's produced using plantations, uh, extensively using slave labor. But what they're saying that slavery means that you have extremely unequal distributions, both of physical capital, because slaves obviously cannot own any land, but also of human capital, right? You have a class of free people and you have a class of slaves. And what they're saying is that this is bad in the long run. It may be good for you in the short run. They were very rich and very productive. But in the long run, this institution is going to hurt you. Uh, and it's going to be really hard to reform them because you have a disproportionate political influence of the elites, which enable them to hold on to these advantages. So one example is when sugar prices went down, right? If you were a more flexible society, you would switch to something else. But you didn't have the human capital to enable you to switch. You had a small class of elite landowners who knew how to do uh, slave labor and sugar, and they could, didn't know how to do anything else. And nobody else was capable of innovating in any other direction, because they were not given the means. right? They were not given the physical or human capital. That's one of their theses, is that in the long run, it can hurt you. Okay. Now, this is fairly descriptive. There's a some other work looking at the similar types of institutions. There's a nice paper with Melissa Dell in South America, which looks at uh, similar cases of very high initial uh, inequality. It was not slavery, but it was sort of forced labor, sort of close cousin. Uh, and they looked at regions which had these coercive labor institutions. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. So let me show you a little bit more. So there's this other generalization. So people, so they said, what about, you can look at within country variation, right? The US had some areas with slavery and these kind of poor institutions and other places with not. And this is a very nice paper you can read. It's uh, in the Review of Economics and Statistics in 2012, where they take the Engelman Sokolov hypothesis and they put together regional data or subnational data on what they call good, bad, and ugly economy. I don't like the ugly classification, but let's think about good and bad, sort of, I'm putting in quotes, good and bad economic activities. What they mean bad economic activities are activities which are associated with a lot of labor exploitation. And these are typically sugar, cotton, mining, where you know, labor is either slave labor or highly coercive, uh, et cetera. So they, these are the kind of maps they put together. So you can see the United States, right? You can see the slave areas in black, and they have obviously some gradation about sort of percentages of activities which employ very coercive labor practices versus uh, not so. So the, the good activities are more, you know, things like uh, wheat farming and so on, which did not have, uh, usually did not have such coercive practices. So these are some kind of samples of some of the maps they put together. This is for the United States. That one is for Mexico. They do this analysis for all the countries in the Americas. So it's a pretty extensive, uh, again, data collection exercise to go at the subnational level. And they actually find a very strong relationship, just like Engelman and Sokolov had predicted on the basis of their nationwide data. They find that you know, the areas with bad colonial activities have much lower GDP per capita, right? 27.6% GDP per capita, lower GDP per capita today uh, than the areas with no activities, right? So suppose that there was no colonial activity there, no colonial powers came in, you would be actually better off than if you had these very coercive types of activities. And similarly, same amount, 27.7% lower GDP per capita today than areas with uh, good economic activity.
They classify an, an area as, as ugly, which is areas which were basically sub subject to labor exploitation for work in other places. Okay, so what do the, the bad is you have a sugar plantation and you're using coercive labor there. The ugly is your population was taken and sent to the sugar plantation over there. So you didn't have the sugar plantation, but you were still affected uh, by those coercive practices. And so they find even that is bad for you in the very long run. Okay, so this is a nice generalization of what Engerman and Sokolov hypothesized that these sugar colonies will not do well in the long run. This is a generalization going beyond just sugar. All right, and then before I go into the non-paper questions and comments, hmm. but this is what you're you saying, you have America, you have it there, <laughs> they did it. All right, other questions or comments uh, on this idea of, uh, this is another example of what people say poor institutions which is, you know, let's call it non-inclusive institutions, right? high degree of inequality on several dimensions. Okay. This is just some evidence on that. So it sort of matches with something we found in India. In India, we didn't have slavery, but we had this high degree of inequality in the land. Uh, it's a sort of physical capital inequality. This is physical and human capital uh, inequalities. Okay. So let me talk briefly about the non-paper which looks at slavery in Africa, right? So when these, are, these are looking at slavery in the newly colonized areas like the Americas, right? These are the places where slaves were brought to. And what none is looking at as well, what's the impact on the places the slaves were taken from, right? How does that work? Does it help them, hurt them? What happens to those places? Uh, and the first thing he notes is the, that Africa slave trade was, uh, which I was surprised when reading this paper, they said Africa's slave trade was immense. So the impact on Africa, they said about uh, something like just between Africa and the Americas, this is the transatlantic slave trade, 12 million slaves were sent across the ocean between 1400 and 1900. So think about how difficult it was to cross the ocean in those days. And they sent 12 million people there. And there are estimates which says that by 1850, Africa's population was only half of what it, it would have been had the slave trades not taken place. So this is a sort of continent-wide depopulation uh, level of slavery. This is not small amounts, which is why he said, well, this obviously must have had some effect. If you take away half the population of a place, what effect does it have? And so the first thing to note is, uh, there are other things I learned because I didn't know that much about slavery and the history there, that Africa had several slave trades. So there was the sla transatlantic slave trade, of course, but there was also the slave trade from sub-Saharan Africa to Northern Africa. So there was a within Africa uh, slave trade. There was the slave trade to Middle East and India. So they were sending people from uh, the Red Sea ports to the Eastern side as well. And then there was the Indian Ocean slave trade, which took people from East Africa, sent them to Middle East, India, or other island plantations uh, in those areas. So this is, as I said, I didn't know that they had so many different types of slave trades in all directions. Uh, the other interesting part was the way the slave trade took place. So it was basically villages or states raiding one another. So you think about how destructive this is. This is Africans enslaving each other. This is not Europeans coming with large armies and capturing uh, a territory and taking people from there. Right? It's quite uh, horrifying that it's a Africans enslaving each other. So there are many reports of people or kingdoms who would try to enslave people from other kingdoms and sell them to the European traders. Or neighbors who would kidnap uh, a neighbor and sell, it, sell that person to a trader because it was very lucrative. Right? The, the slaves were a very uh, expensive commodity. It was a very lucrative trade. So there was kidnapping and enslaving members of your own society, right? So this is, uh, it was not just destructive just in terms of reducing the population, but the way it happened was also uh, pretty nasty, okay? And so what none is saying, well, <laughs> all of this should have had huge effects. Uh, you can imagine that this could lead to the breakdown of, of states and society in general. Uh, and can we see the long run effects today? How long, well, so at that, in those, that period, of course, it must have been hugely destructive. Do we see the echoes of it in the modern day period is what he's asking. To do that, of course, uh, he has to put together, he wants to do a country level analysis. This is a cross country uh, regression. He wants to see, well, if you had a lot of slavery in your past, do you have a, uh, are you very poor today? 
right? does it affect your outcomes today. So now you have to do the, to the outcomes today is easy to get. We have much better data. How do you do if you had a lot of slavery in your past? That's the part which is really hard to get. So again, you should see the amount of effort which goes into this paper is pretty uh, astounding. Um, because first of all, you have country level data today. right? Those countries didn't exist uh, as in the same way. They were not at the same boundaries. They were at, so he has to match records to modern day boundaries. Now, first of all, what records are there? If it's Africans kidnapping each, each other, they were not maintaining detailed records really, right? Mm -hmm. I kidnapped my neighbor or you know, we kidnapped so many people from this uh, above my neighboring kingdom and sold them to, uh, to traders. No, they didn't, that's not the records he can get because the, those things don't exist. So what he gets is shipping data. Because these slaves were shipped mostly out of Africa, he gets shipping data. Shipping people maintain much more better records. Here is a ship going from, you know, from somewhere to, from the west coast of Africa to the southern United States. We are carrying so many hundred or so many thousand slaves. So they would have to file some uh, records uh, at both origin or destination, or at least one of them, saying what cargo you were carrying. Okay? And so that's what he gets, this shipping data from various historians. For the transatlantic slave trade, this data is very good because he is able to obtain uh, data on 82% of all the slave ships that cross the Atlantic. So this is very good for historical data collection in terms of coverage. Okay? Now, of course, the problem is you just know how many slaves came. You want to see which countries they came from. That's the hard part. Okay? So what he does is a, there's a smaller set of data for which the ethnicities of the slaves are recorded. So it's not recorded for all of these voyages, but for a smaller set, as he says, which covers 80,000 slaves. And the transatlantic trade, remember, this is very small because about 12 million slaves across the Atlantic. Okay, But for a very small sample of them, there is ethnicity data on what ethnicity these slaves belong to. So he has to make an assumption that the ethnicity mix from this small sample holds for the entire sample. So as I said, this is the, you see the historical data issues. That's always there in every paper. So you have to assume that. Then he can then figure out, once you make that extrapolation, he can figure out how many slaves of each ethnicity were exported. Then he can match that data to the homelands of these ethnicities in Africa. And then he can match where, now where does that homeland lie in which modern African country. Some of these homelands have been partitioned across different African countries. Okay, that's also a problem. So the, the modern African bun country boundaries often cut through ethnic homelands. So like half of the Yoruba tribe is in Nigeria, and the other half, I think, is in Benin, or the neighboring country. So he has to ad make adjustments for that. So what fraction of the ethnic homeland went to Nigeria, and what fraction went to Benin? And therefore, how many slaves do I assign to have been extracted from the modern country of Nigeria? Because you can see the many, many steps in his analysis to get to a country level measure of how many slaves were taken from this country. This is only slaves, and notice, of course, that these are only slaves which made the journey. A lot of slaves died when on the way from their uh, original homeland to the port, right? Because they were not treated particularly well. And so uh, the harsh conditions means that a lot of people died on the way to the port. So even more died on the ship uh, during the voyage, right? So there are all these issues uh, which basically none can do nothing about. So, but that's what all what it is. So that's what he does. But even then, it's a lot of work to put together this data. So now he has matches with the country location. He gets separate historical records for all four slave trades. Right? The transatlantic is the best documented, but he has similar shipping records for other slave trades. He puts together all of them. And then he puts, obtains a country level number of slaves exported. Because that's a pretty last, large task. So I think he basically spent all five years of his PhD doing this. No, I'm serious, he did. <laughs> so, uh, but it, you know, can imagine how long it takes. So that's what he does. And then he can finally have a country level regression. He is going to regress. His dependent variable is real GDP per capita in, in the year 2000, modern day outcome. On that first variable, look at the first line, which is 
the number of slaves divided by the area of the country. So just to normalize some, by some country size thing, right? Obviously, otherwise large countries will have more slaves just because you're bigger. So it's like the slave intensity uh, of the experienced by that country. And what he finds, of course, uh, the different columns are adding in lots and lots of different controls, but the main message is the countries which had a lot of slaves taken have significantly lower GDP per capita today. Okay? So that's when I'll show you the magnitudes. I think I have a slide on the magnitudes in a minute, but that's the main message that this, there's a big, strong negative relationship between how many slaves you, how much slavery you were exposed to and what you are looking like today. He puts in, as you can see, loads and loads and loads of controls for potential omitted variables. Okay? The number of controls is huge. He puts in all kinds of geography controls. Okay, that's the most obvious thing you might think about that places, you know, certain geographies had more slavery. He controls for all, you know, I can't think of other geographic variables, maybe you can. He does distance from the equator, longitude, rainfall, humidity, temperature, coastline, etc. Okay? Then he, sorry? Correct. Then he does economic activities, gold production, oil production, etc. Diamond production, is it minerals type of thing? Is it mining? He controls for religion, uh, what percent of your country is Islamic. He controls for French legal origin, so it's not about who the colonial power was. And so he adds in lots of controls, okay? And the effect size is still very similar across all these different specifications. Notice, of course, so do I have the magnitude somewhere? I don't have the magnitude, but we can, you can look at the paper for how much this matters. He does calculations of how much this would matter, and it's a it's sizable magnitude. But I don't remember the moment, at the moment the exact magnitude. I mean, how to interpret this coefficient, uh, but he does it in the paper. And of course, you can think about what, there may still be biases, because he has, even though he's controlled for all kinds of things, he also comes up with an instrumental variable uh, specification where he's using what he's, he's using he's using the distance to the slave market as an instrument okay so what is the idea here these are the big ports so look at these are the ports on that side for the Indian Ocean slave trade look at the ports on northern Africa and West Africa these are the ports from which slaves are sent to the Americas uh, and so what he says is for a given location Right? If you were further away from these main ports, you would have lower slavery. Right? Because obviously the cost of getting the slave all the way from this interior part to the port is much higher for the trader, and so they will take less, fewer slaves from the places which are far away from the ports. So he kind of calculates uh, the uh, distance instruments. So he looks at each location, he calculates the distance to the main port for each of these slave trades. And he shows that, well, if you were further away from the ports, you, got, you had fewer slaves taken from your country. So that part holds. And if you just use that as an instrument, you can find the similar kinds of effects that, yes, more slave taken means you are poorer today. So this has a huge effect. Several, so this is, remember, the transatlantic slave trade was banned in 1807. Right? He's measuring GDP per capita in the year 2000. So 200 years after slavery was officially banned, you still see huge income per capita differences uh, based on how many slaves are taken. And some of it is definitely the huge magnitude of, of this uh, slave trade. Okay? So he does this instrumental variables strategy. You can worry about whether these are the right instruments, etc. He does some nice tests. So he shows that the distance to these particular ports really predicts African GDP per, per capita but not from other countries. So you can use the distance to these same ports, say for European locations, and that does not predict GDP per capita at all. Right? So it's not about something about these ports, because you might think, that, well, distance to port is, uh, can affect many other things, but that <coughs> matters only for Africa. And that's because it was slave ports. Hmm. Anyway, so he does nice tests. I want to show you a, a one more thing which he does uh, in a subsequent paper. So you have a very big negative correlation, uh, the effects of the slave trade actually, interestingly, like our paper, become greater after independence for these African countries. So the difference is, this is part of the divergence. They are diverging based on how much slavery they had, which is quite, quite interesting. And then he has a follow-up paper which examines the role of the slave trade on trust. So, it is, so obviously you show this big relationship. Now the question is why, right? Why 200 years after slavery is finished do we still see big effects? 
And that's the part which is harder to make progress on. He has made some progress on it. So he looks at this um, uh, variable on trust. So he gets this data from this Afrobarometer surveys, which is surveys 17 different countries. They ask, how much do you trust your relatives, your neighbors, your local government, your members of the same ethnic group, and members of a different ethnic group? Okay. So these people can answer, I don't trust them at all, just a little, somewhat, a lot, etc. The interesting thing is that this Afrobarometer survey identifies the ethnicity of the respondent. And so you can match it to how many slaves of your ethnicity were taken. Because remember, that's how he constructed He has the slave data. So he's looking at how many, in a sense, how many of your ancestors, or what fraction of your ancestors, so to speak, were enslaved. Right? So he constructs this number of slaves that were taken from an individual's ethnic group. And then he says, does it matter for the kind of trust you um, express today. Because remember, one of the potential channels linking old-time slavery to modern outcomes is the breakdown of uh, societal trust. And you just didn't know whom to trust because your neighbor could enslave you. The, your own government, your own king could sell you, etc. So that's what he says that could, maybe that distrust persists. Right? You learned by hard experience not to trust. And that's what he shows in his paper. Right? So if you look at if on the top are the outcome variables, so how much do you trust your relatives, how much do you trust your neighbors, local council, trust members of your own ethnic group, and trust members of a different ethnic group. And then on the, his main explanatory variable is how many slaves were taken of your ethnicity. All right? And obviously he finds a very strong negative relationship. People who had a lot more slaves taken from their ethnicity express lower trust in everything. Right? Lower trust in the government, lower trust in your family, lower trust in everybody. It's very generalized distrust. It's very strong. This is, again, 200 years after slavery is finished. Right? But it's still very strong. He's put in all kinds of controls, as you can see. Individual controls are he's controlling for age, gender, living conditions, education, occupation. Blah, blah, blah. He's put in like 10,000 different controls here, and so on. So, it survives a lot of at least omitted variables uh, tests. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Doesn't the importance of past history suddenly out over time? Like, like they had slavery in past, so they have this trust issue. So yeah. Like, like uh, 10 years back or 20 years back or 50 years back. That's a good question, actually, if we were re to repeat this with a different time of the survey. So I don't know how, how frequently these surveys are done. It's worth checking. This is the, they are using only 2005. Now the question is whether there's other waves of the survey available. Yeah, no, it's a good question. Does, does it always die out over time, right? As I said, in our paper, for instance, we found the big differences appearing after independence. So it it's, doesn't always. It, ideally, it should. We would hope that history doesn't constrain us. But in some cases, it does. Right? So, the, so here, at least, there's the finding effects 200 years after slavery ended, huge distrust issues. They also do this other interesting thing where they do, here they look at two different things. So they have people, they look at how many slaves were taken from your area versus how many slaves were taken from your ethnicity. Right? Obviously, if you are a person of a particular ethnicity living in your ethnic homeland, they will coincide. But if you are a person of an uh, ethnicity living in the homeland of a different uh, ethnic group, these two measures will be different. And so he's using that difference, okay? When you are living in an area where these two measures are different, which one matters more? Right? How many slaves are taken from your area versus how many slaves are taken from your ancestral homeland? Uh, and the interesting part is he finds that both matter. Right? So look at these variables. Both variables are statistically significant, both showing the same negative coefficient. The ethnicity-based measure is actually at least double the size or three times the size of the location-based measure. So most of this hangover, so to speak, is through your ancestral uh, ethnic measure. Right? So it's something about, so the, this, this relates back to our original discussion of culture. Right? If you think about societal trust as a cultural measure, so it depends on what you define as culture. If you think of it as a cultural measure, this event of slavery has changed that part of your culture. You do not trust. And it really has been transmitted through the generations because your ethnicity-based measure of, uh, of slavery matters more than the slaves who were taken from your area.
So this is just some indications of how these things might matter, and that's where the overlap between formal institutions and rules versus culture sort of starts blurring. These things are co-determined and feed upon each other in different ways. So I think that all those comments were absolutely on point. But there's some indications of why history might matter. It might matter through culture, right? So it's a, that's an interesting hypothesis here. And that I would point out that these are the things we know less about. These are the things. So we've had now a lot of literature and a lot of papers establishing that historical factors do have a big role. And we're still trying hard to understand the exact mechanisms through which persistence happens. Right? One of the obvious questions that people say, for instance, about the Azamoglu Johnson Robinson paper is that, well, the colonial powers put in place bad institutions, and they didn't protect private property, et cetera. But now these countries are independent. So why do you keep having those old institutions? Huh? You know? If you know it's bad and everybody knows it's bad, why do these institutions persist? I don't know. I'm, I'm just saying this is a, it's an obvious question. We don't have a full answer to it. Uh, these are the kind of things people are trying to work on and try to get a little bit more into the details of it, both in theory. So for instance, some papers are trying to think about, well, if these institutions, bad institutions persist, then they must be benefiting someone. Right? They cannot be uniformly bad for everyone. They must be benefiting someone. Who is that someone? Let's try to write down a political economy model of the state and who controls which lever of power. And there are models being written of that kind. We don't yet have very great evidence, empirical evidence, but I'm just saying these are kind of things people are trying to work on. How exactly does historical persistence work? Right? Why should distrust be continue to be higher among these places when they have not experienced slavery for 200 years? This all happened and it was finished, but clearly not finished. <laughs> so these are things we still know less about. These are all fruitful areas for future research. There is some work being done, but these are really open areas. Okay? And of course, as you say, why do they not die out? Why, why this persistence? Or the, the, from the policy perspective, a different perspective, how can we make them die out? Right? Can we stop history from constraining us in the present? Yeah? Correct. There are theories of path dependence, right? Which one of them is right? And how can, because that depends on the, pol that drives policy. If you know which theory of path dependence is right, you can design policy to break it. But we don't know. But you can have multiple theories of it. Yeah. I mean, they, they do the approach, rules of thumb that tend to persist across generations. And, like, people don't consciously think in every period about that, but they keep following what is present there. Correct. That, but again, notice that this is not a very well, well fleshed out theory. It's, it makes sense, right? This is like you've been told by your grandfather not to trust anyone, and your grandfather was told by his grandfather not to trust anyone, and so you hand it down, right? Yeah, so are people really so unsophisticated? Maybe. Maybe we are. There's some literature about stories passing through generations. That may not be told. That they can understand from their parents' behavior. Correct. Correct. So this transmission, what I'm saying is ah. the way this, so you know, I, I'm sure transmission happens. How it happens is less well understood. Right? Yeah. Question? Slavery is the only thing. It says slavery does still have an effect. It's not saying that it is the only thing for sure. Uh, Nobody would claim that, and, uh, least of all the author of this paper, right? It's just saying that, you know, does it still matter today? Apparently it does. Mm -hmm. Correct. That's a whole other stream of research, right? So this is the historical research. This is what I'm saying, what this exactly kind of thing I was saying. How to translate this historical research into actual policy proposals is still a big open field, right? So if you think slavery still matters today, well, you have to figure out, A, why does it still matter today, and how can we design policies to counteract it, its effects? Because the answer is not ban slavery. The slavery has ended, right? The prob that, that's why the historical analysis provides actually it's a bigger problem. This doesn't mean that other factors don't matter. Nobody's saying that at all. Hmm. So I would not want you to take that interpretation. Hmm? But even, in fact, if you look at his, uh, 
forget what kind of R squares he has, right? See, his R squares are not super high, right? Even if you put in, he puts in 10,000 controls and he gets an R squares of 0.8. So this, and this is after controlling for many, many, many things. So there is, uh, there are, there's definitely room for other factors. Correct. So like they had a, a lower uh, nature point because they had bad institutions. But now they are going fast because they have changed those institutions and they are building new institutions. But that's what is not happening. That's what should happen in theory. In the data, it is not happening. So that's the, again the part which is less understood. Why is this persistence? Right? The why persistence is really a big open topic. Because yes, as you said, you should get rid of it now that you're independent. Get rid of all the bad things the colonial powers put in place, and then you will converge. But they didn't. Right? <laughs> they have many decades of uh, end of colonial rule even, and they have not converged. So that's the sad part. So it's, it's out of the puzzling part, let's put it that way. Because that should have happened. It did not. So some studies do, some don't. So this trust study definitely controls for education. It controls for the individual's education, their in current income levels, their occupation structure, all kinds of things. Right. So it's not, it's not fully undoing it. Now, if you had not done the education, would it have been even worse? We do not know. But I'm just saying this here, they do control for all kinds of things here. But that's, what, that's exactly what I mean. If we do not know the exact pathways of persistence, if we knew the pathways, then we could design the policies to break them. Uh, we don't yet. So there is a big open research areas if people want to exploit this. So there's a lot left to explore, is all I want to say. Yeah. Correct. It's not in the of the no, no, but that's exactly what. We, yes. So that is exactly the kind of research which is happening now on the theory side, which is trying to model this, right? Why should the government have an incentive to perpetuate these things, or under what conditions can you do this? So if you look at some of um, Darona Semoglu's more recent work, he's trying to write down these kind of political economy models hmm. to say why these things might persist or why they might not. Hmm. So it's, yeah, but the point is you have to write down a, a sort of internally consistent model to say why this would work, right? All right, okay. Let's get, come to the last paper. We will try to finish this last paper very quickly. This is a paper on ancient Egypt, which is actually a fun paper. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, the, I will skip this in the interest of time. Let me, you can read, I will make these slides available. Uh, I don't know whether they sent you the slides or not, but I can certainly send it. And you can read about the other paper, but I want to talk a little bit about the Egypt paper. Uh, and the theory there is more about what cr creates a capacious state, right? What determines governance quality and political stability? And they're looking at a particular theory where they say, well, creating a stable state requires a source of revenue, obviously taxation of some sort. Uh, and they're putting in two constraints. One is you must have enough productive activities to be able to tax them. So people have to be above subsistence, but also they should not be able to evade the tax. Right? So if you come to tax them and they run away, then uh, your state is not going to be strong. And they're saying, well, let's see how much these things matter. Is that a good theory for predicting state stability and state capacity? And notice that these are relevant for today's efforts. Right? There are lots of states with very weak governance. So the U UN has this fragile states index where they say 32 countries are on alert status, which is they're vulnerable to conflict or collapse, right? literal state collapse. So that's happening even today. It's not that it's a thing of the past. The interesting thing here is they use climate variations as a source of identification of these taxation constraints. So the way they're going to do this, they're going to use ancient Egypt, which is, I was like, this is, this is fascinating. They're using data from 2685 to 750 BC, because the nice thing is the Egyptian state is very well documented about which ruler was ruling in which 
era. They made inscriptions, they wrote these hieroglyphics, so you can date the rulers very well. So you can create a measure of political turnover, right? When was there a change in the ruler? You can also make, uh, that happens in about 21% of their observations. You can also make a change, a uh, variable of when did the dynasty change, right? Because the ruler may have just died of natural causes. That's not really a political instability, but you can have dynasty changes, which is uh, uh, definitely a marker of uh, instability in that sense. And then they use pyramid construction as an indication of state capacity. Because remember, to build a pyramid, you need lots of money, you need lots of labor, you need lots of organizational uh, capacity to gather all these building materials and all these workers and build this pyramid over several years. It just shows how strong uh, and well-functioning the state was. So the, the whole point is they're trying to have these two channels. What they say, well, if you have very high rainfall in the Mediterranean region, then people don't have to remain in the Nile Delta. They can go to the hinterland and do farming, and there the Egyptian state will find it very hard to tax them. So they can evade taxes very well when the Mediterranean region has high rainfall. On the other hand, so that's the one constraint. Uh, on the other hand, they have very, the Nile floods every year. And if you don't have any Nile flooding, you don't have good irrigation, basically, and so you don't grow good crops. But if you have too much flooding, of course, your crops are destroyed. So if you have a medium level of Nile floods, that makes the Nile Delta very productive, and so the, the state has a lot of revenue. Okay? So what they do is they put together this data. This is the regression they're going to run. So they're putting Y on the, um, the YT is either state stability, right? Did you have a ruler change or not? Or did you build a pyramid or not? Uh, and they have these Nile floods, which is uh, they expect a nonlinear relationship, right? So very low or very high floods are bad. Medium floods are good. And they have this rainfall in the Levant, the Mediterranean region. If you have more rainfall in the Mediterranean, then you will have lower state stability because people are going to evade taxes and your state is going to be less strong. Okay? So that's what they predict. And if the point is, of course, how do you, do the why is well documented with these uh, historical inscriptions, etc. How do you find the rainfall data? And this is what I think <laughs> this paper is very innovative. Uh, people, they don't have the rainfall data from historical archives, but they have what they call a natural archive. They have a cave, uh, and they have stalactites in caves where you can date the oxygen isotope. So stalactites are these limestone columns which are growing from the thing. So obviously, it is a time record because it grows super slowly, but you can date the amount of an oxygen isotope in each part of this uh, thing, like a tree rings type of thing, and you can see how much rainfall there was in that period. So it's really cool and very interesting type of data. They have one cave which measures the Levant rainfall, and they have another cave which measures the Nile flooding, which is so the amount of rainfall in the upper reaches of the Nile, which determines the flooding. Okay? And so that's the nice thing. They do this regression, and uh, they find a very nice relationship so here, the, rain, the dependent variable is rainfall in ruler instability, which is, do you have a ruler change? You look at, um, look at column two, right? So if you have Nile, Nile floods, it's a negative relationship, right? If it's, you're less likely to have a ruler change when you have more floods. But it's nonlinear, because if you have too much floods, it reverses, right? So you have this U-shaped relationship, which is exactly what they've predicted. And if you look at the hinterland rainfall, it has a positive relationship to rural instability. So remember, hinterland rainfall means people can evade taxes. And so the state is less strong. You have more instability. And the nice thing is you can check that these two sets of rainfall variables are basically uncorrelated because they are for totally different regions, and they're determined by different uh, weather patterns and so on. And so both of these hypotheses do matter. It does matter how productive your state is, and it does matter whether people can evade uh, taxes. So, that's a, so they find the similar results for the dynastic instability. Both of these are important. They do the same thing for state capacity, which is did you build a pyramid? Right? That's the indication of state capacity. You find similar relationship. Look at column three. If you have Nile floods that the place is more productive, you're more likely to be building pyramids. While if you have more rainfall uh, in the hinterland, uh, also, also uh, you have more likelihood to uh, build a pyramid. Which is, which is interesting, so I was, I was a bit surprised by that. But there's no non-linear relationship with the Nile flood. So this part is less well documented. The stability part is really uh, in line with the theory. So it's just some cool, it's a cool new paper which I wanted to highlight to you. All right, we should end. So 
What will I say about historical data? I think it's really essential to answer the big and important questions. So as Lucas said, when you think about long run growth, the consequences for human welfare involved in these questions is just staggering. Once you start think, thinking about them, you cannot think about anything else. And to answer the big questions about long run growth, you need historical data. Okay. So the uh, second part is, of course, it's extremely useful testing theories of economic development, like this Nile flooding thing is doing. How do states develop? What does matter, et cetera? Uh, and then sometimes it's actually you can discover many cool facts about your own country's uh, history. Uh, and it's a lot of, if for people who like it, you, it's great fun to wallow in the archives. But that is a necessity. You want to do research in this field. You have to have a lot of patience, and you must be willing to spend hours and hours with musty documents. <laughs> Nowadays, most of them are scans and things, so you can get them scanned. But like, you must be willing to spend a lot of time and effort to get one number. There's no quick, easy download thing. Okay, it does not exist. So you have to be willing to do this. But I said, it's sometimes it's a ton of fun. I'm happy to talk about in office hours about all the cool things you find in archives, and not just looking for data, but to understand and interpret the historical number, you need to know the broader history picture. So you also need to do a lot of reading. Because when some number there is just in isolation, you have to understand what they were meaning with that number. What units were they using for land? What units were they using for measuring output or prices? Right? So just to understand that and how that changed over time. Right? So the bigha in 1600 is not the same as the bigha in 1800. So you have to know these kind of things as well to understand and create good facts. But otherwise, I think it is absolutely crucial to understand the big questions. Everything else is micro. This is the big, big one. So I'll leave you with that.